Our first speaker is Talam, Talam AC. Now, Talam is arguably the most profound and prolific spoken word artist of the last decade. He um, is a child of the Newark Rebellion, and um, where his mother, he was raised by a single mother, was part of the writer activist Amiri Baraka's co uh, community organization. Now, I would encourage you when you get home, if you go to YouTube, to search his name and watch one or two or three or four of his videos. He's going to make you mad, he's going to inspire you, he's going to prick your conscience, and he's going to give you hope. So without further ado, our first speaker, Talam AC. Clicker. Hello there. I didn't know that the host was a preacher. We've been uh, talking backstage. Hopefully uh, he'll not be too upset by some of my ideas. <laughs> if there is a heaven, I hope they hold a special place for people like me. Not hot, but you know, just a little warmer, where I'm not forced to sing the same songs over and over again a million times, where I'm not expected to listen to people give long sermons that are not profound, where I don't have to hear hypocrites tell me not to do the same things that they do themselves, where I don't have to re-meet everyone I've already met on earth like some high school reunion that never ends, where I don't have to talk to beings with giant wings and act like I think that's cool or fashion forward. And since we're on the subject, I don't know how I feel about halos because I've always felt that light should shine from the inside out. So if there is a heaven, I hope they hold a special place for people like me. Not hot, but you know, just a little warmer. Where I'm not expected to float around aimlessly like I had some type of frontal lobotomy. Where I'm not expected to smile and laugh all day like I'm trying to OD on magic mushrooms. Where my entire existence isn't planned out like when to talk, when to sleep, when to pray, like I'm sentenced to some eternal penitentiary. I just want to be free. And I've always been confused because if God made us individuals, then how does what constitutes heaven for me also constitute what's heaven for you? I mean, you might want to fly around and play a harp and things or explore the, <laughs> explore the countryside, meet new souls and play games. But me, I just want my aura to increase. And when I return to the essence, I want to rest in peace. So if there is a heaven, I hope there's a special place for people like me. Not hot, but you know, just a little warmer. Because when it's over, what I want most is that sweet release. And what I want most for you is just an eternity of whatever you would consider to be peace. Thank you. So my name is Talam AC. I'm a spoken word artist. I want to do more, though, than poetry. I want to tell you some of the things that go through in my mind, some of the things that I've been taught over the years. Um, I entitled it The Future We Make for Ourselves, because the theme was the future we make, so I was trying to be like half creative. <laughs> <laughs> I should have asked him how this worked, huh? In order to tell you about myself, I have to tell you that I've had two trajectories in life. I um, have an MBA in finance, I have an, uh, a BS in accounting. I used to teach at Rutgers University. I taught at Rutgers, at Rutgers University so shortly after my MBA that some of the people I was teaching were people I used to study with. I um, worked for the Small Business Development Center, which was an affiliate of the SBA. I used to go around and give lectures about business planning and help people get loans and things like that. Uh, but I never really had a real, real job in my life. Does that make any sense? No, it doesn't, right? <laughs> and uh, I was offered all kinds of things. I was the type of kid in school, in college, I mean, that I would uh, go around to the bursar, to the registrar, to the financial aid office and just hang out. I would bring boxes of donuts so that, you know, in case there was a problem, things would go my way, right? <laughs> I, uh, before I got into school for the MBA, 
I started volunteering in the office where they help you get jobs because I thought that would be the smartest thing that I could do. And the funny thing is when I finished, I never applied for a job. <laughs> so that's one trajectory. The other trajectory is after all of those things, I became a, a consultant and so on and so forth, and I got bored. So I actually just changed trajectories and I decided what I was gonna do is spoken word full time. The first time I saw somebody do spoken word, I, I, I just couldn't take it. Like I went in by mistake in a way, because it was the last thing I ever wanted to hear. I just thought it would be boring and people would, you know, but it wasn't what I expected. So when I first saw the first people doing it, I knew I had to do it so much so that I couldn't even stay there for like 10 minutes. I went out to my car and started trying to work on my own stuff. First day, okay? Um, so now, I've been doing spoken word full time for about 12 years. I travel more than I would like to. I take about 100 flights a year. So on average, every three and a half days, I'm on a plane. I've been, in the last two weeks, we were talking about this back there, I was in uh, London, Austria, back to Baltimore, then to Los Angeles, and then back to Baltimore again. And I promise you, if you know anything about souls and traveling, some of my soul, I'm sure, is still in Austria, and I'm waiting to get it back, okay? <laughs> so that's that. My favorite quote is by an economist named J.K. Galbraith. Anyone familiar with him? Okay. He worked worked for uh, FDR, he worked for uh, Kennedy, for Johnson. But this is one of my favorite quotes, if not my favorite quote, which is, there are you know, pretty much two types of people, those who don't know and those who don't know that they don't know. And I'm proud to admit I'm the first type. I'm sure that I just don't know. So when I'm saying things to you, <laughs> I want you to take it from the aspect of somebody who's just exploring thoughts. I'm not saying that this is what's definitely happening. I'm just saying it's possible. Cool? This quote reminds me of another quote which was written much earlier uh, by a gentleman named Socrates, who at least everyone agrees existed because Plato, they just you know, go back and forth as to whether he ever existed. Have you heard of that? Have you heard people talk about that? People, there are people who think that Plato never existed. <laughs> who knows, I wasn't there, that's what I was trying to tell you, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> then there's an earlier quote than this, which is, man, woman, know thyself. And I thought it was like a pressure quote. Like I thought, I felt this tremendous pressure that I needed to know myself. And then it dawned on me that it's not really something that was possible, it's just a pursuit. You follow? It's something that you work towards, you continuously try to know yourself and explore. And in knowing myself and in attempting to know myself, what I try to do is think outside the box. Wow, what a cliche, did I say that? <laughs> so, try. I don't believe in hell, but we could sell it. I said, I do not believe in hell, but we could sell it. I mean, tell them we're the anointed agents of salvation. Sinners, the only way to be forgiven is if you're living, if you're living within a system of precepts and suppositions that we prescribe. Tell them a book that was assembled by the Nazi Council from a hodgepodge of religious texts was literally written by God. Think for yourself and burn in hell. Infernal blazes, ignites hair, singes bone, melts faces into the faceless. We alone determine what faith is. Heaven may or may not exist, but they need to believe. We hold the keys to eternal peace. Christ said, the only way to the Father is through me, and the only way to Christ is through us. Plus, tell him there's a demon powerful enough to the Father, almighty creator. And we're the ordained soul negotiators, and they will pay us to save them from hell which I don't believe in, but we could sell it. I mean, they're already scared. They're already living amongst violence, disease, decadence, and fear. They're already living amongst rank smells, garbage, ghetto slums. Tell them this is hell on earth and the key to our influences and convincing them that, that their afterlife can be even worse. I mean, it's the oldest game in the world, so we might as well keep saying it. Just like the Egyptian God, amen, ain't got nothing to do with Christianity, but it works, so we keep saying it. 
Just like the Old Testament has about as much to do with the new as it has to do with the Quran, as it has to do with hellish wars like the Crusades and the conflict in Vietnam, tell them God commanded tyrants to destroy entire societies and leave no man, woman, or child behind. Don't allow them to know that God is love. Tell them God is vindictive and jealous. Tell them God ain't for the peaceful and the tolerant. God is for the superficial self-righteous zealots in which the simple and judgmental are relished. Oh, I do not believe in hell, gentlemen. But I promise you, we could sell it. <laughs> this is another of my favorite quotes. It says, it's amazing what you can accomplish if you do not care who gets the credit. And I never knew who wrote the quote until I started researching it, because I wanted to tell y'all, but I didn't want to take credit for it. So I just, <laughs> and um, it reminds me of a, a story when they were trying to explain to us in business school what an entrepreneur was. And they said, an entrepreneur is someone who finds a prospective employee, takes them to a cliff, points down at a random uh, palace, chalet, mansion, estate, and says, look at the cars, look at the swimming pool, the tennis courts, if you come and work for me, all of that and more will be mine. <laughs> <laughs> Sam, Sam is uh, a formula that I try to live by. Sam is where S stands for success. The A stands for, anyone? Y'all can talk, right, today? Aptitude, right? So the A stands for what it is that you are skilled at, what you can do, what your gift is. But it's the M that seems to be the most important part of the formula, which is motivation. So S equals A times M. So success e equals aptitude times motivation. And my mother was always telling me when I was younger about people who had all of this aptitude and this incredible gift, but did nothing with it. And it's nothing worse than to have a gift and find yourself doing something that you feel is beneath you. That's why all of those people are mad at you when you're in the market or at the toll booth and they feel like, you know, damn it, I should have just got that PhD. <laughs> this is another thing. Uh, obviously that's money, that's happiness, and you, you follow the grid, right? On the, top, <laughs> on the top, that means you got a lot of money. On the side, that means you're really happy, right? So the question is, if you could be in any of these spaces, which would you be? And the answer, invariably, everybody says that, you know, they know they don't want to be there. They don't want to be broken and unhappy. <laughs> everybody pretty much wants to be there, which is they want to be happy and have money, right? So the next question is, if you couldn't be one of those things, if you couldn't be number one, and you don't want to be number four, where would you go? Would you be happy and not have money, or would you have money and not be happy? Happy and have money? <laughs> so you'd be happy and have no money. That seems to be the trajectory. And the reason why is because it seems that as long as you're doing something you love, success seems to follow. Cool? Good. I'm doing great on time. <laughs> I wanted to talk to you a little bit about depression also. I've known a lot of people, and, and it's a weird way to end the talk, but I've known a lot of people who have crossed over and to the other side by their own hands. Um, uh, starting with uh, a high school girlfriend uh, and then a kid that was a resident of mine when I was a residence counselor in college, but after I left. And uh, most recently, a motivational speaker, which is ironic because you know, motivational speakers shouldn't kill themselves. That's Jersey humor, I'm sorry. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I wanted to present this to her. I used to say this poem when I was married to my daughter's mother and I was suicidal. Not that the two things go together, but I'm just saying. <laughs> you put it together how you want. 
Who made this world? When my wife's man and her husband are not one and the same, where poets are extremely talented and some of them vain, act like they'd be willing to bust one in your brain, especially when they start gunning for name. I swear, the more things change, the further I go insane. I'm shell-shocked. I ain't no good for no woman no more. Perhaps I should just barricade myself and hear what my daughters it don't seem correct to subject some innocent woman to my marriage-induced post-traumatic stress disorder. Sometimes I think this living room couch is going to become my from here on out living quarters. And that eventually, after continuously waking up here, my eyes are just going to well up with water. I mean, a lesser man would just do it. But I would rather be crucified than commit suicide. And any hustler, whether they be dead or alive, would recognize that the look in my eyes is strictly do or die. Besides, people that commit suicide must not believe in God. Otherwise, they would understand that there's a rhyme and reasons why this life gets so hard and they would put their nose to the grindstone and get used to the taste of their own blood because life is a monster of a mobster and you got to get your, chop up, you got to get your chops up if you wish to associate with that known thug. This world is like the Wizard of Oz and until you show some heart, you don't never get shown no love. So when you're feeling desperate, think you done gave all you got to give and you ask yourself who made this world, the answer is simple. You and your actions did. And if you don't like the way that the life you live is changing, then isn't it just as obvious that you must live your life to change the way you live? Happiness is mathematic. That's all it is. Happiness is mathematic. That's all it is. Happiness is mathematic, y'all. That's all. So I want to close out by telling you a, a story, a quick one, a parable that I learned when I was younger. It's about an older gentleman, a sage, who would just sit on a rocking chair and, you know, the older adults would come uh, to his porch and ask him questions and he always had the right answer. And sometimes the children would come and ask him questions and he always had the right answer. So one day a group of kids got irritated by it. They were upset. They wanted to fix it. They wanted to come and ask him a question he couldn't possibly answer. So they came up with a plan where they would take, the bir take a bird, come to the man's house, stand in front of him with the bird behind one of their backs. And sadly, they were gonna ask the man, is the bird alive or dead? If the man said the bird was alive, they were going to kill it and show him that it was indeed dead. If he said it was dead, they were gonna open up their hands and let the bird fly away to prove that he was wrong. And when they asked the question, the old man just sat there and laughed. And when he finished, finally, frustrating them even more, he says, the answer to your question is simple because the answer to your question is in your hands. And just like those children, the future is in your hands. Oh, I'm sorry, that's my hand, wait. The future is in your hands. <laughs> <laughs>